Uh, and this is, uh, we may get to the shame part of it uh, later on in the, in the course. <laughs> But by that point, I don't know if, uh, if all of you will have gone through and experienced uh, the different uh, aspects of what we talk about anyway on your own time and on your own sort of study. <laughs> Basically, this is a course that I'm not altogether sure that I'm going to reach you. I'm not altogether sure that we're really going to reach anybody here. But again, this is a program that's a fundamental part of the college experience. And that's what we'll be talking about. So this is uh, so you prospective students and parents know what you're getting into. I wish you a great summer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. There's not a lot of raising of hands for beer or wine. Not a lot. None. <laughs> what, what, there's one. Why are you pressuring oh. us like that? You're pressuring He's a bad influence. And whoever's sitting on the cooler, it's going to be it's gonna be tough when I reach in there and get the beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, but don't get up. It's all right. It works for all of us. <laughs> Hold on. Is there a beer in there? <laughs> don't worry. I'm a beer master gynecologist. <laughs> Terrible. Sorry, I, I know I went over. I went across the line. I, I crossed the line there. It's like it's, speaking of college students. Um, Mike, Mike Tyson. That's my favorite Mike Tyson joke. Back when Mike Tyson was kind of cool, he was asked to be. Uh, he, they gave him an honorary degree. They gave him an honorary. You know, you know the story. He's an honorary doctor. Honorary yeah, doctorate. So this is, this is, of course, you know, Mike Tyson got away with a lot more things before he was accused of rape. But uh, so he was getting his honorary doctorate degree, and uh, his his speech in front of all the graduating class was, I don't know what I am supposed to be a doctor of, but after after seeing all these foxy chicks here, I want to be a gynecologist. <laughs> You know, Mike, he's a hell of a guy. He's a New Yorker, and Mike Tyson. You know him, George? Yeah, pastor. Does he read? Does he read at the barn? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the cool thing about, about Mike Tyson is he actually got tattooed in the whites, the whites of his eyeball. All right. So anyway, we need a couple, a couple beers, right? One, two. A lot. Of, I'm gonna carry them around, and I'll carry them around. While Mr. Monson Solomon read some of his work, and you, you, are you reading from your book? I saw you flipping your book. That's your book. You're reading from my book. <laughs> I was holding your book. Okay, it's seven dollars. <laughs> I'm just holding it. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. All right. Okay, I have something here. I didn't expect to read when I was coming to support Adam, who uh, took a class with, a workshop with at uh, Grub. And I came in and I saw nobody had signed up, so I uh, signed up. I got something here. I'm afraid it's not in the same kind of mood as we've been having up there. I'm sorry, can you speak up again? Really? I'm afraid that, yeah, that's very strong. Yeah, okay. Sorry, you want me to say that all again? Or? No, no, I'm just, it's just the ice and the ice going around. So okay. It's distracting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, I, I have something here. It's in a very different mood. You can call me Manny, by the way. And uh, it's, an, it's an elegy, and it's about a fishing village that I lived in, spent time in for years and years. And the fishing's, the fishing's gone. The factory ship's coming and taking all the fish out of the ocean, and the whole village life has changed. Uh, you know, kids, kids used to know when they were born that they were going to be fishing and the men and the women were going to be mothers. They'd leave school at 14 and go right out in the boats. And that's all over with. Kind of like the older thing. And uh, life's changed and everybody's moved out. So this is about that. It's a, kind of an analogy, really. Okay. Gone. The late evening throb of Walter's motor as he throttles back and steers into the mouth of the Red River, reaching out over the gunnels, down into his star net, to pluck out the silver salmon and plop them onto the deck. 
Gone, the once hovering salmon, tails undulating, gills pulsating, as they slip along the shore, following the coastline, ready to flash and be trapped in the waiting nets. Absent now, the barely rock high schoolboys humping up the river <coughs> through swirling cascades over boulders to seek the deep pools where the speckled trout lurk, and tricking them with dead bugs and worms and pulling them out and gapping them and stuffing them in their pockets. Silent, the pre-dawn rumble of jerry-rigged Chevy motors, boats heading out, coffee warming on tailpipes, nets neatly furled in the stern, men in green and yellow slickers holding for deep water to cast out, cast out into and drag for bottom-teaming flounder and sole. The bobbing local coastal boats that yielded the ocean to the mammoth foreign factory fleets, which lurk out of sight over the horizon, sucking up the shoals, vacuum, vacuuming them into vast industrial holes, transforming them into instant fodder until they are all gone. No more million mackerel marches, an iridescent host turning and wheeling like flocks of gathering starlings, bait for lobster traps, fleshy fish slabs slipped onto merciless nail spikes, traps pitched into the waiting ocean to be hauled back up into the boats, lobsters dumped out into holes, traps flung back overboard. No more the gray-white tern circling out over the turbulent ocean, prowling the blissfully boiling schools, ready to plunge, hurtling, to spear and pluck from the crowd a single hapless victim. No more Harold squatting sea weathered amidst, amidst these empty beer bottles, mending his traps, bending the bows, seating them in their slots, slipping lengths of twine off the bobbin and knotting them into netted diamonds and inviting anyone who comes by to take Hilda. I'll trade you one 42-year-old for two 21-year-olds. <laughs> no Jenny, half hidden in a spruce copse, highballed hide shimmying, shaking off the flies, cantering out over the field to the evil cliff's edge to whirl and gallop back and pull up and drop her head into the tall grass, white tail flicking over her softly heaving flanks. No boydies scrolling unconscious in Jenny's field. Down below the mangled guardrail, its life leaking away while they wait for the ambulance to crawl its way over the Snowden Mountain. Too late, too late. Forever still, the rasp of Fanky's throat, cigarette, cigarette dangling from the corner of his mouth as he reaches for the bottle again and wheezes again. Have another one. A bird can't fly on one wing and Jean knocking them back while her tumor goes on. No Chester and Betty, Donnie and Agnes, Mary and Willie, Andy and Nancy, passing partners as they square dance right lively at the community hall, while Gordon and his boys fiddle away a spouse's watch, and everyone sits around the walls in hard plastic chairs, slapping time and spooning in their church suppers. No more the young couples mumbling awkward vows before the Reverend McCaskill in the peeling white United Church down by the breakwater. The once filled pews now stark. No lovely local ladies in their Sunday finery. Husbands pulling at too tight collars, dipping sneaked ashes from contraband smokes into the cups of their unfamiliar fancy pants. <laughs> Abandoned now, the lone house in the valley. No Sadie perched in her rocker at the window, crocheting Afghan after Afghan, binoculars at hand, watching for something, anything, to stir in the valley. For someone to pull up at her door, to shuffle out and greet with, the flies, the flies, awful, awful again today, eh? No work again today, eh? The young men, gone for city jobs, no longer race down to the harbor to shine flickering orange beams down between the boats where the smelter running, the smelter running, and filling their hoops with silvery treasure, and back again for more, and more, and more. A lone bald eagle perches on his cliff, looking, 
looking out over the empty ocean until finally futile patient exhausted, patience exhausted, he launches himself out and up and turns slowly in a broad arc, riding the thermal and head, heads inland up the valley in hopes perhaps of a scrawny squirrel. stop in front of the bank, wait for the number 11 downtown, which will take you from that waitress job, which even with tips and kiss and ass doesn't cover. Just feel it. You can just feel it. That car wanted to fly. We rolled down the windows. We beat to the beat on the dash. Oh, my, she said. Oh, my, she said. Oh, my, my right toenail. Oh, my, she said. I do believe it has just had an emotion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the name of the grouchy old man that runs this place? Tom Tipton. Tom Tipton. Good job. Thank you, Tom. Walking on 10th Street, that's New York City. We're walking on 10th Street in the direction of the Neptune Diner. It's a Polish diner in New York City, downtown, Lower East Side, which Simon likes to go to, but you have to get there before 11 o'clock in the morning if you want to have a breakfast special because, well, it's important because Simon likes to arrive while they're still offering brunch which means unlimited orange juice and endless hot cups of coffee. Well, we run into Max Camber, but there's no time to shop. It says stop and talk to Max Camber. Besides, Simon doesn't like Max Camber these days because, well, he doesn't want to talk to Max Camber because even though Max studied film at UCLA, he does not know how to approach his subjects with what Simon likes to call sympathetic objectivity. <laughs> and so we shake Max Camber's hand and we keep on walking. Eventually,